we are really honored today to have one of our own and alumnus to come back to Columbus State. We enjoy having all of these executive speaker, uh, speakers come to speak with you to share with our students and faculty. It's our way of trying to bring the boardroom into the classroom, but it is an, it's an especially great treat when we have an alumnus, someone who is a graduate of one of our own programs. In fact, he has two degrees from the Turner College of Business, his undergraduate degree as well as his MBA. And to have one of our own to come back to speak with you is uh, a, just a real treat for us in the Turner College. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Mr. Terry McDaniel. He is a graduate of this college. He got his BBA in 1979 and his MBA in 1986. He comes to us, he's originally from Columbus, but he comes to us today from Phoenix, Arizona, and where he serves as the president and CEO of InVenture Foods. It is a publicly traded company that is traded on the NASDAQ under the symbol SNAK, SNAK. Uh, InVenture Foods is comprised of a snack food and frozen food division. And as you'll learn today, the company has a very diverse lineup of consumer brands sold nationally and internationally. Uh, I have had a great time actually getting to know Mr. McDaniel this morning. We had an opportunity to visit and realize that we know an awful lot of the same people right here in Columbus, Georgia. So it's been a great visit and I hope that you enjoy hearing him speak to you about his own experiences. I hope that he won't be shy and will tell you about his days here as a student, including all the things that he liked as well as the things that he didn't like so much, but how all of those things really prepared him to be the great success that he is, he is today. Join me in welcoming Mr. Terry McDaniel. Um, thank you, Linda. And uh, we did have a great meeting. Little did I realize that we both worked at First National Bank uh, while I was going to Columbus. Uh, and if I say Columbus College, I apologize. But it's ingrained in my brain, and it's still on my diploma. It's Columbus State. Uh, but uh, we talked about our days working at First National Bank. That's where I worked while I was here in college, working my way through school. Um, and boy, has it changed. I think this is the first time I've been on campus actually walked through campus since 1986, where we did the graduation for the uh, master's program outside. And so it has changed a whole lot. There used to be just a student center. You walk to the business, uh, uh, where all the business classes were, across the bridge. And today, I couldn't even figure out where any of those places were. So it's uh, great to see that the university is doing, doing well. And it was a major part of my life uh, growing up here. I will tell you some of the things that happened here while I was at college. Some I'll have to hold because uh, my mother-in-law is uh, in the audience. and <laughs> So I can't tell you everything, but I'll tell you a few things. So, and, and as I go through this, if you have any questions, I want to leave time for questions at the end. This is not going to be successful unless we have a little bit of interaction. Um, I was born in Columbus, Georgia. I grew up in a neighborhood over there off airport throughway called Kingston. I, uh, you know, I played Little League Baseball in the Pioneer League and Babe Roof and I uh, played Pony League football and I uh, had a great time growing up in Columbus. Uh, my dad worked out at Fort Benning. Uh, he was in silver service, uh, was over supply control and storage, and my mom worked at a hospital. Um, growing up, uh, one of my first, uh, besides having fun as a kid, one of my first jobs was with the Columbus Ledger Inquirer and I had a morning paper out. And back then, when you had a paper out, you would actually go out. It wasn't like today where you, you, there's a bill, you send it in, or it's online. Uh, you would go out and pay for the papers. So you buy the papers from the Ledger Inquirer. You deliver them, and then you go to the homes and collect $2.90 a month. It was $2.90 to get the paper. And so you were in the collection business, and then you were balancing how much you pay for the papers versus how much you collected. And usually during Christmas, you would get some extra. And there was a few people that never did, and their paper wasn't always delivered in the same fashion as the others. <laughs> but uh, that was my first job at 11, and I had that up until uh, I turned 16. I also had a lawn cutting service in the neighborhood. I about, had about five lawns. I'd make about $15 a lawn. And I made $5 a field up the Pioneer Little League calling games. And so I started real early. Uh, trying to you know work hard and, and develop a work ethic which I think is critical 
to the success of anybody. It's even more critical today than it was uh, when back in my day. And I feel so old in front of this group. Uh, but, uh, you know, I look at those times and I look at going to, I, I went to Brick David Elementary, Arnold Middle School. I don't even know if these schools are still around. And, of course, Hardaway High School, I know it's still here. And I uh, felt like I got a, a really good education and had some good life experiences along the way. When I turned 16, I went to work for a Lewis Jones Supermarket. And I started out as a bag boy and worked my way up to stock clerk and ultimately a, a co-manager my first year while I was here at Columbus State. And I, I needed to work my way through school. I know a lot of students, uh, you know, you, if, if your parents can't pay for it or you're having to get student loans, I had to work my way through school. And, and, I, and, and the good, good thing about Columbus State, it gave me the opportunity to work and go to school and to graduate within one quarter on time. And that, I think, being able to live at home was to my advantage. Uh, I know some of you are probably in dorms today. I see a lot of apartments around. Uh, I think you can get just a strong education living at home. Uh, the academics doesn't change whether you live at home or you live in a dorm. There's some other things that change, uh, but not the academic uh, uh, advantage that you may have here at uh, Columbus State University. Um, my freshman year in uh, college, I decided that you know, for me to graduate on time, I needed something more part-time. That's where I think Linda was at First National Bank. I went to work at First National Bank as a part-time teller. So I would go to school. I had three classes. Back then we were on the quarter system. And I would go to school 8 to 11, three one-hour classes, and then eat lunch, go to the student center, eat lunch, and then go over to First National Bank, and I worked as a part-time teller. That was a fun job because I worked in the drive through So you, you, you had to wear a tie, but I could wear shorts because no one could see from here down. So that was a... That was a great experience, and I had a great time working uh, for First National Bank. Um, you know, my, my life uh, here at Columbus State was great. I mean, some of my best friends are still uh, people who I went to school with at Columbus State, even more so than, than Hardaway. Um, one of them was my neighbor in Atlanta delivered my son, Richard Bardwell. Now, that's kind of strange. Your neighbor, your fraternity brother delivered your, your son, but... Uh, that's how close, close we were, and uh, we remain close today. Um, Mark Ray, who uh, has two kids coming to Columbus State now. Uh, he has a daughter and a son. Mark works for Troy University. He was in uh, my fraternity in college. Uh, by the way, the fraternity was Sigma Pi. I believe it's no longer on campus. There may be a good reason. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it was a great time. In fact, I'll show you a picture that will scare you. Uh, it will really date, date my age and, and the group that was with us when we chartered the fraternity. And I think Teak started the year after. I think Teak is still here, I believe. Yeah, is, that, is that correct? Um, but had really, really a great time through that. Um, and and some, again, my, my, the friends I made at Columbus State, even though I've moved, I've lived in New Jersey, Minneapolis, Atlanta three times, Braden in Florida, and now Arizona for nine years. They are still my closest friends. Uh, many of them were in my wedding. Uh, we still get together, um, usually in the summer, uh, down in Florida. And uh, in fact, I'm having dinner with two of them this evening. So take advantage of these times here, not just from an academic standpoint, but uh, from a social standpoint. We had something called the Sports Car Club of America. Now, I had a Cutlass, so I'm not sure that was a sports car. <laughs> Nobody joined, but I mean, a few people had MGs and uh, one guy had an Austin Healey, and these were cars that they don't make anymore because they only ran about 1,000 miles, and you had to take them to the shop. Uh, but uh, we would do these road rallies as part of uh, the social life here at, at Columbus State. And from an academic standpoint, you know, I was not uh, a gifted student. I had to work at it. And, uh, but, you know, it, it was great. Um, what you have here that you don't have in some other universities was a smaller um, ratio of students to professors. So you can ask questions. And I know online is big. I mean, there's a couple of universities out in Arizona, University of Phoenix, uh, Grand Canyon University, big online programs. Uh, I know Troy University has a big online. I know Columbus State has been recognized, and those are great. But for me, it was great having that one-on-one -on -one relationship where you could have open discussions. Because I'm going to tell you, no matter how 
sophisticated our communications are today, it's still about 101 communication. It's people still buy from people they trust. And, and so there is a relationship side of business today as just as important even with all the, the changes that have happened with Twitter and I guess my son's doing Snapchat and all the other things that are going on from a communication standpoint. I remember some of the professors here and the impact that they had on, we were talking about uh, different ones earlier with Linda, and I, I remember some of the business professors, people like Dr. Hamilton, who was over statistics. Uh, Rick Moore, who uh, also taught statistics. Now, what I remember about Rick Moore, the first day in his class, he said, look to your left, look to your right. One of you are going to fail this class. <laughs> that was a real motivator, I'm going to tell you. It, it really was, because it it just told me I had to really stay up with statistics because it would build on itself. And for those that are in the business school, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, Dr. Emery, who was over the business school, there was a few things he told me uh, as I was going through my graduate program that uh, really stuck with me in life. And one of those, and I, you may say I'm failing at this today, but he said, you know, Terry, things are going good. You're doing well with your grades. You know, you've got some work history, but you know, you need to work on your speak, uh, speaking in front of others. You're, you know, you're, you just need to work on it. You don't seem confident. You feel nervous. And it really hit home with me. In fact, to the point I joined Toastmasters and got involved. And, you know, I, I just rem and I, I heard just uh, from Linda that he was up here the other day. I'd love to see him and tell him thank you for the influence that you have in my life. Because these professors at this university, the things they're telling you, some of it will make a big difference. You don't even know it today, but you'll think back. I kept all, I still got all my papers from grad school. I mean, I, I, I have them in a file at home. I pulled one out the other day because we were debating whether a broker representation was better than a direct. And a broker is where you hire a third party to represent your brands versus direct where you have your own people represent your brands. And, um, you know, some interesting things. We were having this debate. I said, well, here, I wrote a paper about it when I was at school. I don't know if it's relevant today. It was still relevant. And, you know, the business school, the undergraduate school, it was, it was great, great socially, great from an academic standpoint. I'm here today, I'm going to tell you, if you're graduating from this university, you got every opportunity that someone graduating from Harvard has, or wherever the university is. It, it is not going to define your success if you graduate from, uh, as long as you get a good education, and you'll get a good education here. Because after the first job, no one is going to say, well, God, he graduated here, and compare uh, where, where you're, you're graduating from, and whether you're an Ivy League school or a great state university. There's been a lot written about that recently. There was an article in the New York Times uh, this last week, about two or three months ago, in the Wall Street Journal about sometimes education, we're spending too much for too little return. I think this is a great investment. Now, it's gone up since I had to pay my way. It was 165 a quarter. 165 a quarter, we would have, that was a lot of money back then when you were making a dollar or 85 an hour, okay? Uh, and and I, you'd have to go into the, to the uh, gymnasium and you, they had cards and you try to get people ahead of the others to make sure you got the right class. Our fraternity had a system. We won't talk about that, but uh, you know we found a way to make sure we got the right right professors at the right time. Uh, you know, but there's uh, of course a lot of that uh, a lot of that has changed. Um, and I would also say for those who are an undergraduate, think about a graduate degree. It will make a difference. Uh, I had the the benefit of going on with my graduate degree and I was working at Tropicana and I was able, Tropicana the Orange Juice Company, I was able to take some of the work that I was doing, which graduate school is a lot of independent work, and I was able to take that work and focus it on our industry. And when it came time to, a, an opportunity came up uh, to move to the headquarters in Bradenton, uh, the fact that I had the master's degree, the fact that I had done independent study on our industry and had used that at work, I think gave me uh, an advantage. And I, and I really received more, I believe, from my graduate degree than I did my undergraduate degree. Maybe because I was more mature, I was a little more serious uh, at that point. Uh, but, but it was difficult too. I would 
I took one course a quarter. I waited until I graduated and waited a couple of years to do that. I think you need to get out of school a little bit, get a little background, and at least from a business standpoint, I think it's good then to go back. Then you can apply it to the business that you're in. Uh, but I would, I, I would go, I was living in Columbus, and um, I, would, I got promoted to a job in Atlanta, but they wouldn't move me. So I'd go to school here two nights a week in grad school and drive to Atlanta the other two nights, stay at the Radisson Inn up near, near North Druid Hills. I don't think you'd want to stay there today, but uh, it's changed. I don't know what it's like on its fifth owner of hotels. But uh, And to study, now I would not recommend this because I think one of the most dangerous things that we do today is text and drive. But I had a Chevy Citation as a company car, beautiful uh, chocolate brown Chevy Citation. For those who are in the room that can remember Chevy, it was, it was kind of like the Gremlin, if you remember that, or the Pacer, or the Vibe. I think, hopefully, no one's got a Pontiac Vibe. That's one of the latest cars that come out that just didn't have the exact appeal that you would want. But the steering wheel had an indention, and you could put your book and your notes on the steering wheel. And back then, it was a two-lane road going back and forth between here and Atlanta. So I would, uh, uh, or two, uh, four-lane, two on each side and I would drive and study on the way back. Uh, so uh, it, it was not recommended, but it, it really helped me because I, I was working full time. I was, I, I was married at the time, um, and uh, I needed to, what little bit of time I had, extra, spend time with my wife and friends. And uh, so that, that was a great experience in the graduate school here. My original intent was to go here two years and then go to University of Georgia. I mean, I grew up a Bulldog fan. I mean, I remember my dad taking me to Georgia games when I was young. And my cousin, had uh, she had gone to the, the Shannon Hosiery Mill School here at Columbus State for two years and got her associate's degree and then went up to Georgia her last two years. And I mean, I was such a dog fan. I, I mean, I had a red and black cutlass. And uh, I, so I was going to go here two years, go to Georgia two years. And what happened is I got involved in the campus, and, and I, I think a college education, the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. And that just doesn't mean in the classroom, but other activities um, within uh, Columbus State to become a part of. And I got so involved, I, I didn't want to leave. And at that time, I felt like I was getting just as strong an education as I could go sit in an auditorium and watch a TV at Georgia for a lot of the classes that were going on for my friends that did go to Georgia. So, uh, so I stayed and it has served me well and I'm, I'm very thankful for it. I mean, I'm very, I'm very thankful to be here today to just tell you a little bit about what it, what it was like back then and then how much it has meant to my career and to ultimately, hopefully, uh, some of the successes I've obtained started with a good education uh, at Columbus State University. Job history, I told you a little bit about the early jobs, and uh, while I was here, I, w I moved from teller to installment loan to, um, I was the repo man at First National Bank my last year at Columbus State, and uh, that was an interesting job. You know, it's great about how you locate people that won't call you back, and, and you meet some interesting people, and you go in some interesting situations. Um, Probably one, and I won't tell you which university, but it's within an hour and a half here. But probably one of the more famous people I repossessed their car was the quarterback of a major university's football team. And uh, what was so interesting, I went over to, to, to um, that university. I thought I was going to get killed. I'm walking in the athletic dorm, and these guys, I mean, they're a big time university, and I asked for their quarterback's name, and, and uh, he was very, very nice, very cordial, uh, gave me the car. You know, when you're, when you're playing football, you don't have time to, to really work. But what was amazing, the next day he came back over, um, had all seven back payments plus the next two years of eligibility in cash. <laughs> I don't know how that works, <laughs> but, uh, but it works somehow. And I guess that's why Herschel Walker was able to drive that smoky bandit black Trans Am working during the summer at the dealership, he was able to afford that Trans Am, but somehow there, I guess some, there's some benefits. Uh, so from there, I, I did a, a short um, time with um, Ford Motor Credit. I really wanted to go into sales and marketing. I love marketing, I love 
presenting products and, and um, you know, trying to build revenue. I mean, you, by the way, you got to build profit too or it doesn't matter how much revenue you build. Um, so I went to Ford Motor Credit, I moved to Albany, Georgia, or as they call it, Albany, Georgia. Yeah, you think people are friendly down there because they're doing this, waving at y'all? They're sweating, swatting those gnats. But uh, lived there a couple years and then had an opportunity to go with the Carnation Nestle Company in sales and to go on their management training program. Back to kind of, I knew the food industry. Um, at that point, Ford Motor Company was laying off about 50% of their marketing people. It was a bad time for the auto industry. It's when gas prices spiked. Uh, you know, they, they, they're in a good time now, but uh, many, as you know, back in 2008, they came through some rough times. It wasn't a good time to be in the auto industry. So, so that's where I started my food career. Um, I started out basically calling on retail stores, calling on Fleming Food that was out near Fort Benning, which is a big wholesaler. Um, you know, I would go in, I would sell things to the stores, I'd reset shelves, I'd clean the shelves. I, I would say that when you graduate, you may not get the exact job you want in the beginning, but be thankful for the job you do get and do your best because if you do your best, you, you won't be in that job forever. I was thankful. I, I woke up, I said, oh, God, I'm making 16000 a year. They gave me a company car, and I got an expense account, and, and I, I don't have to go to an office every day. I, I died and gone to heaven. I said, does it get any better than this? And... Um, Kind of worked my way up through there, got promoted to call on A&P in Atlanta. And uh, then I, and, and they were not going to move me, so I was doing the commute back and forth on a graduate program. Then I had an opportunity to go with uh, Tropicana in Florida. And that's where the graduate degree really made the difference between me and, and some other candidates. And my wife and I uh, moved to uh, Braden in Florida. Now, Braden, if you've never been, Braden in Tampa, it's where people move to die. Uh, you know, there's... Believe it or not, Delta's number one back then, their number one cargo item was caskets going back, back north. So here we are, we're young, <laughs> it's sad, but, but it's a great place. It's, it's a beautiful place. And we're, you know, we're young and you had to wear a coat and tie and I go into the Burdines, which is a, used to be a big chain in Florida. Where'd I, where'd I buy a coat and tie? Uh, nobody wears coat and ties here. I said, well, they haven't told that to people at Tropicana. But it was a great life experience. Uh, my wife was in banking. Uh, she had worked here at CBNT. Uh, she was employee of the month a couple of times. She's got fond memories. A great company. Um, it was a great company back then. I, I see it still receiving awards for best place to work and all these other things uh, that they've been able to accomplish through the years. And uh, so she's working for the bank and uh, they're talking about selling the company. And, you know, here I am in Braden, in Florida. The only really corporations down there was Tropicana and Wellcraft Boats. And so I said, oh, my God, we're going to get stuck here in Braden, in Florida, because they're talking about moving the corporate headquarters to New York. And this, this kid from Columbus, Georgia, is not moving to New York, okay? <laughs> I am, I'm not going to, and, and I, I'll eat those words later, uh, but... I, I didn't want to move to New York, so I had an opportunity to move back to Atlanta, and, uh, which we did, and, and that was, that was a, a great move. One of the things I'll tell you guys at the end, you know, broaden your horizon. There's a lot of opportunities in Columbus, but don't limit yourself. It's not a bad thing to, to branch out and to try other opportunities. You can always come back if you don't like it. It has certainly served, my well, served me well. But I've got a lot of good friends who have stayed and done well here too. So it's whatever, whatever you want to do, you know, wherever you want to go. Uh, so moved back, and I was part of uh, a company called Pillsbury. We had the Alpo uh, Pet Food Division, which I was part of. We built it up. I was uh, worked my way to running about three quarters of the sales. They were going to move me up corporately. Started to sell that company, and they said, "Well, if you'll stay with us, we'll put you in the Hagen Dazs." business and I met someone earlier who was in the ice cream business at one point and uh, so I moved to New Jersey said I'd never move there I mean, boy this was quite the move um, our home in Atlanta we moved there the price of the home was double for the same square footage and my taxes were three times as much 
and I got a 15% raise and a cost of living adjustment. And uh, so I, I, the first day we're up there, we go to the A&P, um, and we're going, and we, Lisa, my wife, writes a check. And, I mean, bells went off, whistles. You can't write a check. You've got to get that approved ahead. And Lisa said, where have you taken me? So, and, and it, was, uh, it was quite the experience. But we learned to love going in the city in New York. It turned out, it turned out great. Um, she still said, I don't understand this promotion. You, you make, we're, we're worse off, and yet when we had to move here, so how does this all work? I said, trust me. And uh, of course she has. She's been very supportive of every move we've made. And uh, while I was up there, part of the thing I was, I was looking to do, um, you know, I had set goals when I graduated from Columbus State. I knew I was going to go to the sales market route. I wanted to be at a region manager within five years, uh, excuse me, a district manager five years, region manager 10 years, within 20 years be a VP of sales. And that's, that's the highest. I, that's, I said, God, I don't think I can, I don't, don't, want, don't want to do anything else. And I set those goals, and so I'm at haagen and they said, well, look, Terry, if you'll make this move, we're going to make you director of trade marketing, and that's kind of managing all the money related to uh, different sales, street marketing, and other things. And then if the VP of sales jobs comes open in a couple of years, you'll have an opportunity for that job. And uh, what happened was within a couple of years, I, we didn't get to a couple of years, four, min, four months into the job, the VP of sales leaves. There's three other vice presidents and myself and I said, you know, I made this move. Here's the big opportunity, and I'm not going to get a chance. And they did an outside search and an inside search of the three VPs. And somehow, I put a presentation together. I said, here's what I'm going to do in the first three months. Here's what I'm going to do in the six months. And none of it was, I'm going to beat the sales. It was, hey, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to learn. I've never gone into any job uh, like I know it all, because I don't. I still don't. In fact, the day I know it all, they should fire me because it's all downhill from there. Because you got to continue to keep learning. And so I had an opportunity, that was my big break, and I had 700 people in my organization. I had a finance group and operations. We had company branches throughout the US. Um, they decided after a few years, and this is what happens in corporate America, they wanted to move haagen into the Pillsbury building in Minneapolis. So we moved to Minneapolis. Uh, now Minneapolis is a great city. If you could ever move there and get through the first two winters, you will love it. I mean, very family-oriented, great public schools, great education uh, system, uh, great public parks. And, uh, but it's, you know, you don't talk about the number of years you lived up there. It's the number of winters. I mean, the first winter, it was 30, there were 30 days where it never rose above zero within a 24-hour period. Yeah. Uh, the second year, I had so much snow, we had a... My daughter was seven or eight at that time, and we had a basketball goal, and they plow your driveway. The snow was to the top of the basketball goal almost till May. It was right April. It's, it was about gone. And, uh, but, it, but it was a great experience. I worked for the president of Pillsbury and had an opportunity to uh, go to, um, back to Atlanta. Um, a friend of mine who had stayed back in New Jersey Got involved with KKR, any of you guys know? K KKR is a private equity group. If you ever saw an old movie in the 80s, Barbarians at the Gate, it was about, um, it was about uh, KKR. They're actually a lot better than that movie talks about. I mean, I, I found them to be really supportive and great people. Henry Kravis was the K in KKR. I had present to him a few times. But um, a friend of mine called who had moved there with HR, and he, he said, Terry, how's the weather? Now that day, I was on the 36th floor of the Pillsbury building. I couldn't see the ground for the snow clouds below me. And I said, Tim, you know darn well how the, how the weather is today. And so uh, he said, well, just come talk to us. He said, we're looking for someone to help in the sales and marketing area. And uh, you know, within a year or two, Bill's going to retire. KKR, it was a turnaround, wise snack food, the owl. It was uh, at that time about a $300 million business. And um, they said, and the good news is you don't have to move back to New Jersey. You can go back home to Atlanta. And so all of those things were attracted to me. 
And I made the move, and within a year, I had an opportunity to, to move to the CEO position. That was back in 1997. Uh, we built it up to about $400 million in sales. Um, we were making no money. We ended up making about $16.5 million in, in earnings and uh, sold it for two and a half times what the, uh, the brand was on the books. Uh, great experience. I mean, every place I've worked, I, I, I tell you, I get up every morning, and we have a kind of a saying at work. Uh, one of our brands is TGI Fridays. It's a licensed snack brand. A lot of convenience stores. And that's, thank God it's Friday. I said, I hope you're getting up every morning and saying, thank God it's Monday. You know, every place I've been, I don't regret any of it. I loved every opportunity, even the difficult ones. And I've learned a lot through that process. And uh, so we built it up and sold it. Uh, one of my life lessons is staying with, um, if, if you're part of building a business and if you sell it to a new group and you don't, you're the one selling it and you don't get a chance to see the financials and everything, probably not a good thing to stay with the second group. Uh, it's kind of a life lesson that I learned. And hopefully you, everybody makes mistakes as they go through their life and their career. And it's okay if you learn from it. So I ended up uh, ultimately going with the company I'm with now in Venture Foods. It was a turnaround. I'll walk you through that in, in just a minute. Um, and again, the benefits, uh, kind of this before I start going through the presentation on our company, I think there's a lot of great benefits. I, I, this campus is amazing. My, my daughter just graduated um, from the University of Southern Mississippi in grad school. She wanted to be a family marriage uh, therapist. And uh, they have one of the better family marriage therapist school. They actually have a clinic on campus. She graduated with 1,000 hours of actual practice. And she started applying jobs online all over the country. And I, I don't know if it's a guy thing or a miracle or whatever. But within an hour, she gets a job. Uh, they want to talk to her the next day. And it just happens to be outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, you know, I spent time on the Southern Miss campus. This is a much nicer campus than Southern Miss. This is, this is a really, uh, it's amazing what has happened and the changes. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised. I still think small. I'm thinking Columbus College. You know, one thing I want to talk about, broadening horizon. Maybe I need to broaden my horizon. And this is a, this is a big time campus and a great school. And uh, it's what you do with it. The more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. And you can go anywhere you want with, with a uh, degree from here, whether it's in, I mean, I know there's great nursing programs. I think there's still the dental hygienist program. That's how I got my teeth cleaned in college when I couldn't afford to go. Have, you go there and have someone experiment with you. <laughs> a couple of our little sisters in our fraternity um, uh, were, were in, the, in the school, and they would get you in. I think it was a dollar. It was a dollar to have your teeth cleaned. So anyway, uh, but, uh, but it was great, and it's been great for me. Let me walk you through a little bit. This was, this was, this was our fraternity. <laughs> okay. I, I wish I still had some of these sport coats, but... This is, that was me uh, back in 19, I think that was 75, and we were, we were chartered on campus, and that was in front of the Davidson Center. It's the Davidson Center. I couldn't see it through all the buildings. Okay, it's still there. And uh, some of my buddies or some of my close friends that I talked about are still part of that picture, and uh, Mark Ray, who I'm having dinner with tonight, and just, uh, we, look, we look pretty rough, didn't we? <laughs> Yeah, my, my, uh, my, my parents weren't too proud of my hair that flipped up in the back. And now my son wants to keep his hair longer, and I, you know, I can't do that. I might as well just go with it. I've never shown him this picture, by the way. <laughs> this is some of our pictures uh, as of late. Uh, this is in our corporate office in Phoenix. We've got a shopping cart. When we designed the office, we said we're in the food business. Our last corporate office looked like an investment banker, uh, I mean, looked it looked too corporate. We're in the food business. We sell food. This should be fun. You know, we work hard. We're results-oriented, but we have fun along the way. We're not creating a cure for cancer here. And so we've got exposed beans. We, we do all sorts of crazy stuff. There were supposed to be some snacks delivered. I don't know if they never made it. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, they're on the way out? Okay. All right, so you guys can try some of our products. But uh, we rang the opening bell for NASDAQ in uh, 2011. 
Uh, it'll be our 20th anniversary as a public company. They've asked us to come back and do that again in January. Uh, and this is something that I'll talk about later. This is, by the way, this is my son. See, he's still got the Braves. I'm trying to keep that Southern influence in his life. So I don't want him to become a Westerner. I don't want him to become a California boy, okay? Uh, and then this is my wife. And this is some of our employees. We were doing a homeless shelter that night. And one of the things I'll talk to you about, wherever you go in life, you know, try to give something back. I think it's very important. I think you'll get more from it sometimes than the people you help. And we've certainly incorporated that as part of our culture. I just have to say this, we're a public company. I've been in private and public, but if I say anything here today, you can't, I can't guarantee it's true. <laughs> that's, not, that's just saying anything I say is, uh, you know, we may not be correct. If I talk about projections, they may not be right. And this is all part of Sarbanes-Oxley. For those in the business school and you're later, you'll, you'll understand uh, why I have to put this up. A little bit about our company. Um, coming into Inventure Foods, it used to be called Poor Brothers. Now, why was it called Poor Brothers? There were two brothers named Jay and Don Poor who started the company. And Jay still works with us, and I'm real proud of that. He's 60-something years old. He's our vice president of engineering at our Goodyear facility. But he started something called a kettle chip and was one of the first people, to, even before Frito-Lay, the 10,000-pound gorilla axe murderer, uh, and I apologize for anybody who works for free life. We just don't think uh, kindly of them. And they're owned by Pepsi, and I only drink Coke. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it, he started the business, and it was that and TGI Fridays when I came aboard. It was $69 million business, and it was in trouble. They had basically taken out a good portion of the management team. And I'm going to talk about some of the transformation. We changed the name. The name used to be Poor Brothers. Now, if you're selling a stock and your symbol is poor, that is not a good symbol. I hopefully you agree, snack is a little more catchy, S-N-A-K. And so we changed the name to it, Inventure Foods. And Inventure stands for Innovative and New Ventures. Innovation is key. If we're just going to make everything that Frito-Lay or somebody else has, then we're not going to be successful if we just copy. We had to come up with a more innovative product. Uh, we've been public, like I said, since uh, 1996, um, and there, therefore the first of the year will be our 20th anniversary. Headquartered in Phoenix, uh, we have about 1,000, uh, 820 permanent employees. We probably keep another 300 that are temps. And then during the uh, season, we have some farms up in northwest Washington where we grow raspberries and, and uh, blueberries and a little bit of rhubarb. We'll hire another five to 600 kids. Uh, mainly through Bellingham uh, Western Washington University and the local high schools uh, to help us with harvest. We have, by the way, we don't do them picking berries. We have these harvesters that go through the field. So it's kind of an automated process. Today, uh, and we got about 19 and a half million shares outstanding. Today, we've got frozen fruits, and I'm going to go through each of these healthy snacks. We just bought a company uh, here in Georgia frozen vegetables uh, about a year ago called Fresh Frozen. You'll find it at uh, Winn-Dixie, Piggly Wiggly, Walmart. It's in a clear bag. I'll talk a little bit about that. Frozen beverages, uh, Jamba smoothies, make-at-home smoothie kits. That's in all the Publix, uh, the Kroger's. Uh, plus, we do some of our own customers' brands. Um, I'm trying to think who would be. There's not a Trader Joe's here, but if you buy their olive oil chip, uh, under their brand, we make that product for them. And then our indulgent snacks, which is where we started the business, which is TGI Fridays, Valdea. Uh, they're actually from South Georgia. I try to interject some of my roots into this company along the way. I think I'm the only, well, I have on our leadership team, there's one other person from Greenville. They went to Clemson, and uh, we only talk about that once a year. This year was a good year, last year not so good. Um, some of the highlights of the business that we've been able to, um, our employees have been able to deliver is consistent organic growth and revenue, earnings and stock price. Um, innovation, I'll show you some of the innovation, some of the things that we've done, like the Jamba Make It Home Smoothie Kits, we were the first to, to do the Cube technology. Uh, we have strong portfolio of national brands. We have diversity in our product portfolio and the channels that we sell product. And then uh, season management team, when I put that up, uh, 
people say, does that mean old? Uh, we're experienced, okay? I, I don't know about it. We do have some youth, and we got some great young people coming along. This is our revenue. Uh, when I came on in 06, we were about 67 million. This past year, we're 285 million in net revenue. Um, we're growing at about, uh, on a compounded growth, on an annual basis, we're growing about 21%. The food industry in general is growing about 2%, so we're ahead of the curve there. Our earnings per share is uh, growing about 18% on an annual basis, and our stock price has grown 40% uh, per year since 2010 on an average basis. So we've had some great success, and, it, and I'd love to be able to thank everyone who's been a part of it, but there's 800 people that participate in that success. And uh, it's hard work. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, we joke in the leadership team, every day someone from Frito-Lay or General Mills are trying to take the shoes off my kids' feet. So we gotta, we gotta be ahead of them, we gotta stay tough. One of the worst things about success is resting on it, so we can't rest on that success. One of the things that did drive our success, we decided, we looked at where consumers were going. And we saw in 2006, consumers were going to start eating healthier. I bet people in, I mean, how many people in this room have had kale? Okay. Up until about four years ago, that's what in Atlanta you would put in your pots in the winter. And, and you grow it because it grows during the winter. I had no idea it was edible, okay? But today it's, and by the way, the next kale, you guys are going to not believe this, but collards is going to be in the next kales. A lot of the same properties in collards that were, were in kale. Uh, but we decided we needed to make products focused on healthy, healthier lifestyles. So we were going to convert this company. We were less than 5% healthy natural. Today we're about 85% healthy natural. And we converted it through some of the brands I'm going to talk about. The other thing is healthy companies, if you look at the multiples, we're a public company. So we have to think about our shareholders and the multiples they're, tr they're trading at. They're trading at at least two to three times better than mainline food companies like General Mills. They've got a lot of base type products that are kind of center of the store. So we focused on the healthy natural category. Uh, for the full year, we were 85% fourth quarter. We were 83% healthy natural. And in that healthy natural category, we got our Boulder Canyon all natural snack brands. Um, we've got Raider Farms, Fresh Frozen, some of our premium private label. And then our indulgent brands, we got TJ Fridays, which is not a growing part of our portfolio. It's important, it still pays some of the light bills, 17% of our sales, but it's going to get smaller and smaller. Where we're going to become a pure play, healthy natural company. Some of the innovation um, protein is big. Uh, the product in the left, Protein Chris, this has 10 grams of protein made with pea protein and it actually tastes good. The bad part about protein, it's, it's one of the hottest health trends. The bad part is it doesn't taste very good. This product actually has a great taste. We've been able to, to, to work with it and develop and it's got a nice uh, crunch. Over here on the right is a product called Fresh Start. It has kale, spinach, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. Juicing is big. Smoothies are big. You don't want to buy all of those ingredients and have to throw half of it away. So frozen, and by the way, fresh, frozen is fresher than anything you're going to buy in the Publix produce section. If, it has, if it's been picked more than three days, it starts to lose nutrients. And frozen, we pick it at the peak of ripeness and lock those nutrients in. So the actual frozen fruit is fresher. Now, the problem with frozen fruit, when it thaws, it's not great table fruit. But if you're making smoothies, putting it on your cereal in the morning, putting it on your haagen ice cream, still partial to all those brands following. And haagen is still the best ice cream, i got to tell you. Um, so that's an easy way uh, from a combination. We're the first to put fruit and vegetables together in a bag. On our Jamba product, this is uh, the cube technology. General Mills came out. General Mills is in the U.S. is $6 billion. I don't know what they are worldwide, but they came out with the YoPlay smoothie kits. You may remember those. Um, we had the technology first. They had more money to get it out there faster. But we ultimately got it out to market, and that's the number one smoothie brand sold in supermarkets today. Number one in Walmart, number one in Target. And uh, it's very simple. Pour it in, add white grape juice and apple juice. It's just fruit, nonfat yogurt, and a vitamin boost. 
very healthy, tastes as good as anything you're going to get. On. I don't think there's a Jamba store in Columbus, but it's just as healthy and tastes better. And it's only, if you use apple juice, it's only 120 calories. So that product has done very well. Uh, some new technology we came up with in the last year. Vitamins, fruit is very healthy for you, but it doesn't have a lot of vitamins. So we've come up with a, a process that we have patent pending where we can give you the same taste. The fruit doesn't look any different, doesn't taste any different, and it's all done naturally, no frankincense, no needles. Of uh, Up to six of the top vitamins, 100% of the daily requirements in one serving. So that's something we're testing right now. And, of course, my Georgia favorite, when I, when I came out with Valdea onions, those people back in Phoenix in my marketing department, well, nobody knows what a Valdea onion is. I said, you, you, everybody knows what a Valdea onion is. <laughs> and, it, and it really has worked. And it's the sweetest product. We work with, uh, the Valdea onion's got high viscosity, and it's very difficult to get into a seasoning blend. And we work with some people, the Bland Farms, the largest uh, Valdea onion grower in, in South Georgia, and we were able to get it into the right format. And it's been a very successful product. I'll save this bolder turkey and gravy flavor. I know it sounds gross, but I'll tell you the, the, uh, about that in just a minute when we get to PR. On some of our new products this year, um, you, the veggie straws that you buy, I see people buying that at Sam's and think they're getting their kids, oh, this is much healthier, it's got vegetables. That product is a pellet that's fried with a little bit of vegetable powder. There are so many myths in the food industry. Read the uh, labels. We came out with an organic smoothie. Now I'm going to tell you my view of organics. Um, I, I think it's a personal preference. I'm not sure organic still uses certain chemicals. They still use certain chemicals, so I'm not sure it's any better. In some cases, the quality of the fruit and vegetables are, is not as strong. It's not as good. So I think it's a personal preference. But if consumers want it, we're going to come out with it. Um, we, we've got an avocado oil. A chip cooked in avocado oil, a chip cooked in olive oil. You go to Sam's here in Columbus, we're, we, it's a permanent item, the Boulder Canyon olive oil chip. And we just came out with one cooked in coconut oil. And uh, again, healthier oil. So we're trying to take snack food that has historically been not good for you and use healthier oils, all natural seasoning, lower the sodium, lower the fa uh, fat grams. And that's been our focus and it's worked very well. Um, on our, our fresh frozen line, we came out with steamables. We're doing some organic fruits. So a lot of different things going on. I mean, this is all just anybody can come up with a new idea. I mean, even, you know, sometimes our finance guy has some actual, some, some really good suggestions. And, you know, I mean, we were fortunate. We hired a CFO with a personality, and uh, he's, he's pretty creative, too. Uh, and no offense to any of those that are finance majors. Well, what, who was it I heard say that, uh, um, why, why did I go into economics? A famous economist spoke recently. When he recently went into economics, he didn't have the personality to be an accountant. So anyway. <laughs> um, our facilities, we have, and I'm not sure if this has got a light on it or not, but we have one up in London, Washington, where we uh, freeze fruit. That is where the one farm that we have is about 1,000 acres. We're not really farmers. We have kept it because it was a legacy part of the business. Um, in Willamette, we have a freezing operation and a bagging. That's one of the greatest regions for growing raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. Uh, Goodyear, Arizona, and Phoenix is where our headquarters. Goodyear is right outside of Phoenix is where we make our kettle chips. And then Georgia, we have a plant in Thomasville where we freeze a lot of vegetables. I think 50 million pounds a year we're freezing down in Thomasville, a lot of peas and carrots and squash. And then we have a bagging operation up in Jefferson, and then we have another snack food plant in Bluffton, Indiana. We're in all these different retailers. That gives us the advantage. We can leverage uh, different retailers. When we bought Fresh Frozen, they were not in Food City. We had relationships in Food City. That's a big chain up in Virginia and uh, Tennessee, and we're able to leverage that relationship. I mean, we're most convenience stores, a lot of vending machines, you'll see our product. Uh, we're in Ross Dress for Less for a while. We're in AutoZone. Uh, so, hey, uh, you know, we should have them here on campus. All right? That's, uh, anywhere there's, uh, you know, snacks, you can sell them anywhere. Uh, a lot of companies are expanding their food offering. And, and then, you know, a lot of the natural retailers, uh, Whole Foods, Fresh Markets, 
Is there a fresh market here? Yeah. yeah. We're in fresh markets with four of our Boulder items. Uh, that's the seasoned team. Uh, we're fortunate all but one person uh, has uh, been with our, our leadership team. Uh, Dan came on. We, we created a new position. We split our company into a snack division and a frozen division. And uh, that's the only new person. But you look at the backgrounds. Our, our CFOs from Canada, um, you know, uh, Steve Scalora, our VP uh, for our snack division, is from uh, Manhattan. So we have people from all over, and it's amazing. We all just we all have a common goal. Uh, all our cultural whatever differences they don't really come into play because we're all working on building a uh, platform in the company. We're also fortunate to have some good uh, board of directors. We were able to change our board out, up, upgrade it over the last few years. Part of being in the food business, if you want to grow, you got to be in the categories that have growth. Okay, uh, you don't want to be in frozen meals. Healthy choice is not healthy, and it's declining 5% a year. Uh, but we're in the natural snack category that's growing 11%. Frozen fruit's one of the fastest growing categories in the frozen section. So we're fishing where the fish are. We're going after where the opportunities. And staying true to our strategy to become a healthy natural food company. On our frozen food sales last year, was up 53%. Now, without the acquisition, it would have been up 20%. Uh, and a lot of our growth is happening there in the items I mentioned earlier. There's not a Costco in town, but that's in every Costco in the U.S. It's uh, frozen raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. Uh, great for smoothies, uh, highest quality berries. When they do, if they do, um, they've got to put a Costco here eventually. And that is some of the highest quality food you're going to buy. Uh, the Jamba smoothies, uh, that, that is growing. And fresh frozen. We believe we can take fresh frozen. It was owned by an individual entrepreneur. Uh, he didn't want to spend the money at, at this point in his life, and uh, we were able to work something out. He's happy. We're happy. He's still part of our group. Uh, he's a consultant. I hope he stays as long as he'll, he will stay. I think he made about $45 million on the deal, so he's playing a lot more golf today. And uh, so, so he's not as, as, as uh, motivated as he once was, but still he's a great guy to uh, to, to um, pick his brain. On the Boulder Canyon brand, this brand was up 70% last year. Um, IRI measures supermarket withdrawals. The category last year was up 2.6%. Boulder was up 44.7%. Boulder Canyon was up 64.7%. Uh, so uh, great growth there. We're going to keep building that. I mentioned the frozen vegetables. You probably, hopefully you've seen that somewhere. I know Sean had, bought, had some in his freezer. Uh, when our CFO called me and he said, Terry, what's this? Have you ever heard of Fresh Frozen? He said, I said, are they in the clear bay? I said, yeah, I said, yeah. I said, got some in our freezer. By the way, you can't find peas in, in uh, Phoenix, so we have to take them and freeze them and put them in an insulated ice bag with, and, and take them back in our suitcase because they, they wouldn't know a southern pea if it hit them with it. But. <laughs> Indulgent specialty. Uh, that's, that's the other brands that you see a lot in convenience stores, Walmart, uh, places like that. Our premium private label uh, business is growing the category. Uh, we were up 5% in 13. We were up 47% in 14. Sprouts, there's probably going to sprouts. There was five put in Atlanta last year. It's a farmer's market, one of our best accounts. Uh, if you go to Starbucks, ever have the kettle chips? We make those kettle chips. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip through this because I really want to get to the, the last piece, which is more about if I could, I mean, what I think was important, going, what's important going forward once you finish uh, your, your education here. Um, we're going to continue to grow both internally and externally. We're always looking at acquisitions. Most of our growth, the majority has been internal. But if we find the right acquisition that fits our strategy and we can add value and the cultures fit, so many people buy companies and the cultures never, they never get that right and it never works. But you gotta be able to hire, you gotta be able to work with the people that you're, you're acquiring. And, and if you go in and you think you know everything and you're gonna take it all over and you're gonna show them how it's done, that's a disaster waiting to happen. You bought the company because they had a lot of good things to offer. What can you learn from them? And then how can you combine and, and help them uh, remain more successful? At least that's our viewpoint on acquisitions. Here's some of the accolades. Uh, I won't go through them all. Consumer Reports, Rachel Ray, Best Chip in America, 
Uh, Forbes, we've been named uh, best small company in America for three years in a row, and uh, they highlighted us this year in their annual issue of best small companies in America. Um, we, we came up with this product for Target. It was in a turkey bag, and it was flavored uh, chips. One was turkey gravy, one was pumpkin, one was, um, what's that? Cranberries, yeah. I, and, you know, I, when I first looked at it, I said, God, turkey and gravy chips, just, it didn't seem to go to it. Well, it went viral. We were on Good Morning America. We were on Kate and uh, Kelly and Michael, uh, Queen Lativa. I, all these shows, they took our product and highlight. We had over 250 million people see that product through that PR. So that's the, the power of, for those that are in communications, public relations, I, I think that is so much stronger than, than traditional advertising for the future, particularly on the web. I mentioned giving back. Uh, last year, our company gave over 3,000 hours of service to numerous organizations. Um, you know, there's a lot of them up there. The UMOM, which was the homeless shelter. We adopted some children's uh, third grade, fourth grade classes around the holidays, did some parties, big brothers, big sisters. The one I'm most proud of is the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, they are transforming clubs, uh, kids in Phoenix. And I tell you, we, I, probably the greatest uh, honor and th most fun I've ever had was being chairman of this year's event. We just did a couple weeks ago. We raised over $2 million. Twelve kids were uh, Youth of the Year. The one that, that the person that won it uh, was from a war-torn African country. Uh, many of her relatives, including her dad, was killed in the Civil War. She came over here. She was homeless. And she's been accepted for pre-med at the University of Arizona. And a lot of credit goes to the mentoring. It's not about the money. It's the mentoring that people have given these kids, particularly those that work at the Boys and Girls Club. And we were given an award a couple months ago, transformational award, as transformation come by the Arizona business leaders. They're the true transformational award. They should win that. And I encourage you, really encourage you to get involved and help. Uh, you know, it said, for who much is given, much is required. And I truly believe that. And we've made a commitment, and I'm as proud of that as any of those numbers that, for our shareholders and financial, uh, the financial side. The future, uh, we believe we've still got a great future. I mean, success, you know, you, again, hopefully we never get comfortable with it. Uh, we've got some great potential with our brands. Uh, we believe we've got some fresh frozen is a whole new opportunity. The clear bag, people looking for transparency. The brand is growing while the category is, is not. New technology, like I mentioned, on the uh, fortification. And then expand our pro product portfolio to keep up with where the consumer is. If the consumer wants it, we need to be there. It doesn't matter where our personal preferences are. If the consumer wants gluten-free, gluten -free, we're going to be there. Life after Columbus State. Um, I think this is an important step. You, you, you got to check the box and you got to get your degree. And the more you put in, into it, the better off you're going to be. I would recommend broadening your horizons. I mean, you, you got to remember, when I left Columbus, Georgia, I don't think I'd been out of, we'd gone to Panama City, uh, maybe to Ocala, and my uh, mother's parents uh, were tomato farmers in Slocum, Alabama. So I had never really been out of three states till I, was, till I came to Columbus State. All right, and so moving out of state, back then when I would drive up to Atlanta for a Braves game, I would have to turn the radio off because I was so nervous driving through downtown Atlanta on that four-lane I-85. So it was, a big, it was a big deal to move from here, and, and it was not easy. But, um, you know, and I'm not recommending you move. If you can find it here, keep it here. But don't limit yourself. Broaden your, broaden your horizons. Set career goals. It's just like anything, a business. You've got to have goals. It doesn't mean, and don't get discouraged if you don't achieve them at the time that you had set. But at least have some goal posts out there so you can see how you're doing. It will help you when you get to that point to make decisions. The thing I look at and the people we've hired and have been successful from a career standpoint, they're not the traditional ones. 
it's not necessarily, it's great, you need good grades, you need to work hard to have good grades, but the highest grade point average won't necessarily lead to the most success. There's a lot of other things that are required along the way. One is passion. I talked about uh, my, my daughter changing her career and a passion for being a psychologist and, and trying to talk her off a cliff if she gets a B. I mean, God, when, she, when I'm, don't ever move your child. If she, you have a daughter in high school, don't move her across country. That is, that is, that is uh, that's another lesson learned in life. Uh, but she kind of really kind of messed up on her grades when we moved her to, to Scottsdale. But when she got into college and got into what she was passionate about, I had to talk her off the cliff if she was going to get a B. I said, Lauren, a B's not bad. You're going to be okay. You're going to get through life with a B. And, and uh, she is so passionate about working with kids. And she's going to be successful because of her passion. So if you're not passionate about what you're doing every day, if you wake up every morning, and, and some of you who are in your career, if you wake up every morning and you say, oh, God, i got to go to work today, I've got to deal with this person, and, and yeah, I, I haven't been treated fairly, you probably either need to change your mindset or you're not in the right uh, profession. Work harder than average. I, I know there's a lot of discussion about work-life balance and all of this. Yeah, you need work-life balance. But that doesn't mean you don't work as hard. You figure out how to balance the work with the personal commitments to your family, to your friends. I think work-life balance is when, I hate to say it, when a college student comes in and starts talking about, well, I have work-life balance, it's a red flag. Not that we want, we want people to have strong families. Our culture is very simple. We all came from larger companies. We hate politics. It's results-oriented. And we treat people like we want to be treated ourselves. There's no ceremonial leaders. You know, you don't need an appointment to come into somebody's office. Nobody's better than anybody else. We all have different responsibilities. But sometimes you have to work hard. And if it's a close of a quarter, the finance people, guess what? They're closing the books. They're in there. They're working late. But I think today, I think youth have a better opportunity than I did because I don't think there's as many people committed to work as hard as they used to be. It's simple. It doesn't mean you kill yourself. It just means you, if you see the people around you, work an extra hour when you, when you get in that first job. And don't just do it to check a box, but really make something out of it. It's like college. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Positive attitude. You make a decision every morning. If you're going to wake up, how, what, what kind of day you're going to have? If you wake up in the morning, and again, you're thinking about, oh, God, how am I going to get all this done? I got, you know, this, this, she's not very nice to me, or, and he's a jerk, and I hate working for that guy. Guess what? You are going to have a terrible day. Wake up every day positive, that you're working for yourself, that you're working for a higher power. Not, that you're, not just that you're working for your own personal satisfaction. And if you do that, you'll like your job more, no matter how bad the job is. Um, maintain integrity. Nobody will follow someone who doesn't tell the truth. No one will follow someone who only thinks of themselves. One of the books I read early in my career was Servant Leadership. And I tell you, it is so true. You need to get, just because you're a leader, you, you have a responsibility to make, help make those people, to give them the tools to help them be successful, to serve them. It's not all about people serving you. Um, be a team player. Um, there's so many people that they have a tough time in team situations. Graduate program, I love the graduate program. You're up here and you're working in teams. And you have four or five people. And some of those people, guess what? Some of them don't do as much work. Have you ever been on a team project and so and so never shows up? Got five excuses, and you get. And I went through this talking to my daughter in grad school. You know, oh, nobody's doing work. I'm doing all the work. I said, well, then do it. You're going to get more out of it. You're going to be more successful for it. But being a team player is not taking all the credit. Whatever we've accomplished, I can assure you, it's not because of me. It's because of a multitude of people who've come together for a common goal. Never stop learning. I said that earlier, and I really mean it. We sent our people to all sorts of programs. I, I got a young man that came, came to us. 
So over our purchasing group, I promoted him three times. And I said, you need a little more business acumen. So I pay for him to go to grad school. Okay? I, I really believe that you, you've got to keep learning. I, every time I go to a seminar, I'll go to a convention, and I'll try to catch a couple of seminars. And I learned some things. I was at the Roth. There's an investor conference out in California a couple of weeks ago. And the guy wrote the four uh, uh, execution, Sean, uh, I know some of you in the business would know this book, but I left that meeting with three things we were going to do different in our company. And some of them were simple things. Uh, but, it, boy, it kept, keeps my mind going. And the day, again, that you think you know it all, that's when you need to quit because you'll never be as smart as you were that day because everything changes around you. The last thing, you know, give back. Uh, all of you are getting a great education. You have a chance to be successful at all different levels. Try to get involved and give back uh, to your community, to your church, whatever it may be. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll end this with I've, a couple of uh, people, and I know this, and I hope, please, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but a couple of people have been very important uh, to me and my success. One is my wife, who's my greatest partner, 31, 31 years. I mean, she has put up with a lot. She has moved from nine times we built 10 homes. Uh, that's enough for to destroy any marriage. And uh, so she has been such a, a great supporter. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to, to watch. My daughter got married uh, down the beach uh, and down the panhandle about in September, and I said, you know, I love her more today than the day I married her, and I met her through a fraternity brother at Columbus State University, William Wardlaw. He works for Aflac. Okay, and uh, so that, and then, and then the second person that's probably more important is my faith, and that has been the greatest strength in helping me make decisions has been my belief and my faith, and my shareholders would probably, it would probably scare a few of them, that I pray about big decisions, and I pray we make the right decisions, and we have a lot of people's lives entrusted with us. And that has, I mean, you know, I don't think I'm smart enough to do some of the things we have to do at times, but I've got a source of strength that if I would encourage you, whatever your faith may be, to get connected to it, because I think it can help you uh, throughout your career. And I apologize, I don't mean to throw that in there, but I would be remiss and I would not be telling the truth and I certainly wouldn't be giving you one of my most important things that have happened in my life through the years. I was fortunate that an aunt uh, got me involved back when I was 13 or 14 years old. And I tell you, I probably strayed a little bit in college. Fortunately, I, you notice I didn't show you any of our fraternity house. It was right across the street. And uh, I'm surprised the floor, after doing Old Blackwater, uh, the Doobie Brothers, on that floor about uh, every Saturday night. I'm surprised it's, it's still there. So I strayed a little bit, but it has been the greatest sense of peace and strength that I, and I'm thankful for growing up in Columbus, Georgia, because I can tell you there's a lot of places that, uh, that it's not as, as accepted, and it was great growing up in the Bible Belt. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you guys today. I'm sorry I talked so long. I, I said, God, I can't talk for an hour at my team says I can't even say hello. It takes 15 minutes. So, so I will open it up for questions. And I, anything, seriously, anything is fair game. Okay, there's got to be a yes. Yeah. Uh, well, there was a lot of different, you know, there was different companies doing interviews, insurance companies on campus. I think you guys got a campus uh, fair today. I think the first job, certain schools, they may get the first look, but after the first job, nobody's going to care. Just get the first job, get the experience, and then it, it, it's, but I didn't see it as a, it didn't hurt me when I was applying in the food industry. I mean, I was applying against people that, probably Georgia, Auburn, all the typical suspect schools around here. It didn't hurt, but I could see if a, a certain speci uh, specific type career, maybe a Ivy League school would get the, obviously they would have the advantage in the beginning. After job one, it doesn't matter. It means, 
I mean, the guy I hired uh, for the job is Notre Dame. And he wanted to talk about his SAT score. And I say, you know, at where you're at in your career, I don't, I don't, really doesn't matter. Then he tried to say that Notre, it was tougher to get into Notre Dame than Georgia. And we looked up the average SAT score, and he was wrong. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so no, I don't, I don't think it has any, any bearing long term. Maybe the first job, it may have a little. That's my opinion, at least what I found. Any other questions? Yes. I, I don't think it, it, for me it worked because I was living in Columbus and I had such a great experience in the undergraduate. I actually finished my last 15 hours at Kennesaw State because I was moved to Atlanta with a job at Tropicana. I, I don't think you have to. I, I do think for at least from a business standpoint, I think it's better to have a little bit of work experience while you're going through your graduate program than to go straight to graduate school because uh, I think you'll miss out on some of the opportunities to use that graduate work with the business you're working with. Yes? Uh, of course, the Internet is tons of, tons of connections. Uh, work through the school. Work with friends. Keep calling. You know, the one time that I, when we sold the business and I was, I think I was out of job for a month, and I, mean, I just started calling friends and talking to people I'd work with, and that's your best source. It's no, the people that you get to know through, through school. Um, my first job in the food industry came from John Teasley. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. He was one of my best friends. He was in the food industry, went to Columbus State, and he told me about the job at Carnation. So network, the Internet is such an uh, important piece. My daughter, she went online one hour. She's got a hit. She got a hit for a job up in uh, North Georgia, one in Kansas. And uh, so use, use the Internet. Yes? What uh, do Moving my daughter at, uh, when she was 16, I would have probably commuted for two years. Um, you know, one, one thing when I, we sold WISE, um, I decided to stay with the current owners and you know I, I prayed about where I should go and I had a job with Brock Candy running Brock Candy and I turned it down and staying with a lot of my equity that I had rolled over and then the day you know funny how things work out and in that particular case the guy who took the job had to shut a plant down in Chicago he and his vice president of operations had to live with 24-hour protection around their family for over a year so I made the right decision because putting my family through that it is is not worth it um, you know so there was some regrets when I did make that decision some regrets in moving my daughter um, I, I'm sure there's there's some mistakes I made along the way I wish I had not made um, I wish I had um, matured I, I kind of got thrown in some jobs early on in the beginning I thought well God I need to hire people that think like me work like me uh, well, I couldn't tell anybody to talk like me, but uh, but because uh, I was up north and uh, southern, um, and I realized that that's the wrong mistake. That you need to hire people that don't think like you, don't look like you, don't talk like you, so that you get a rounded group of people, which is kind of what we have in our leadership team. I guess those are those are a few things. Well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come back here.